Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Emily Lancho. I'm the curator and director of the DeVos Art Museum. Thanks for joining us today for this panel discussion. Uh, I'm just going to start with a few programming notes before we actually get started. Um, we will have a talk in March, on March 15th. Uh, Dr. Mitobo will be uh, delivering a talk about mirrors and art, and also he will do a recap or a synopsis of the uh, the faculty exhibition. I was going to say senior show, but that's not here yet. Um, and then on March 22nd, April South Olson will be doing uh, uh, giving an artist talk, and then following that, she will give a encaustic workshop. Um, so an encaustic painting workshop. It'll be free and open to the public, but it'll be limited in terms of seating just for the workshop part. So. Um, if you're not on our email list, you should do that. So if, if you want to come to that, because that's how I'll release that information is through our email list. Um, that is generously sponsored or supported by the uh, MCACA. So we're really thankful for the support for that, for the exhibition, and for a bunch of our programming, inclu including some education um, this year. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the friends of the DeVos Art Museum and our annual donors because they're really the people that allow us to do programming and exhibitions and all of that, so we are very appreciative. Um, finally, I would also like to introduce you to uh, Rachel. Oh, one more thing before I do that. Call for entries. Uh, North of the 45th, this is also uh, supported by MCACA. Uh, it's an annual show. We've been doing it for years. We have a really great drawer this year. Um, Stephen Bridges, uh, people are welcome to submit five things. It's a $20 entry fee, but then your work will be in the museum this summer. We do a catalog with the show. It's really great. So apply before March 22nd. And then I'd like to welcome Rachel um, Fugate. Rachel is here in the room. Um, she is our new collections curator. She uh, grew up in Western Pennsylvania, but because of her schooling and her career, she's lived all over sort of the Eastern seaboard. Um, she uh, graduated from Syracuse with an MA in art history in 2012, and her thesis entitled Bovine Brotherhood, Edward Jenner and British Masculinity sought to discuss the notion of a gentlemanliness in British physician Edward Jenner's portraiture and how the cow acted as a vehicle for this quality. Rachel has held positions in, as both a college educator and uh, a museum person in general. Um, and uh, right now, uh, she's really interested in the paintings of Toma Apps. Uh, she's also excited to start working with the permanent collection and um, excited to get used to this place called the UP. She came here from Florida. so. She's been here for like three of the last storms, so wish her <laughs> luck um, and welcome, Rachel. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to get started on our talk here. Um, sitting next to me, I have the four panelists from Art and Design. Uh, sitting right next to me, I have Gabrielle McNally, um, who is our digital cinema professor. Um, she works mainly in experimental, autobiographical, and essayistic nonfiction, exploring the notions of documentation, family history, genealogy, inherited memory, place, fragmentation, ritual, and performance. Um, Gabrielle executes all aspects of her works, including the conception, cinematography, editing, sound design, and musical composition. She graduated with an MFA in film and video production in 2014 from the University of Iowa. In her time in Iowa, she also completed a certificate, certification in gender, women's, and sexuality studies. She collaborated on feature films in Iowa before attending graduate school, and she received her BA with honors from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa in 2009, focusing her work on video, performance, installation, and installation. Um, she also studied uh, vocal, music performance, theater, and dance, participating extensively in all of these, and she continues to include a lot of these techniques in her work. Um, now, her work has been screened internationally in several film festivals and in the U.S. Uh, next to her is Brian Kakis, who is the Associate Professor of Ceramics here at NMU. He received his MFA in ceramics from the University of Notre Dame in 2007. 
He's been in over 50 solo and group exhibitions and is part of an international museum, uh, or part of international museum permanent collections in China, South Korea, Australia, Indonesia, Romania, and the US. Uh, he was awarded the Silver Prize at the 5th Korean World Ceramic Biennale and the World Exposition Ceramic Center. Um, he's participated in many, many uh, career level exhibitions, including the uh, first Canadian Grand, Pr Pri Grand Prix for International Ceramic Arts Exhibition in China, the Cluj International uh, Ceramic Biennale held in Romania, and the third Jakarta International Biennale in Indonesia. He was a demonstrator in the 45th National Council of Education on Ceramic Arts Conference, and most recently his research with raw materials and soda vapor kiln firing methods have resulted in the construction of the first soda kiln in Indonesia at the Gaia Ceramic Design International Artist Studios. Next is Stephen Hughes, who's best known for his colorful acrylic portraits, having shown in numerous pop culture and illustration-focused gallery exhibitions in California and New York, as an artist residing in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and professor of illustration at Northern Michigan University. He can often be found exploring the natural landscape of the coast of Lake Superior with his plein air watercolor kit. Uh, his painting and illustration work revels in the interplay of light and color and the emotional impact of quieter moments of determination, thoughtful reflection, and preparation for a thing that must be done. Finally, last but not least, Steve Larson has been creating images with computers since uh, an Atari 400 computer showed up in his home. While technology has changed a bit since then, he continues to utilize the computer as his primary production tool with the majority of his time working with 3D animation. His work is influenced by biological growth, quantum physics, synesthesia, abstract expressionism, and his work as a medical animator. His animations have been shown in over 200 exhibitions throughout the world, including the Priars Electronica, ACM SIGGRAPH, Electronic Theater, and Anima Mundi. Uh, Larson received his BFA in Media Art from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and an MFA in Computer Graphics from Syracuse University. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> little bit more. Uh, so the title of this talk is on practice, and I think practice is something we talk about a lot. Uh, maybe more people are used to um, talking about practice in relationship to sports, but I think a lot of artists say my art's practice or um, you, you know, practice makes perfect, things like that. So thinking about our sort of practices outside of the classroom, um, how if you could describe your practice, what that's like, if it's daily or not daily, if it's weekly or not weekly, or how it ebbs and flows, and how that influences your work or how you talk about making work with your students in the classroom. <laughs> uh, I'll take the mic. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't sure if we were just gonna go down the road. Um, okay, so how do I practice? Um, so I, sort of envision myself as a collector of ideas. I grab ideas um, via images. So I have a Pinterest, uh, you should all follow me on Pinterest. Um, I have a Pinterest board that I keep all of my um, sort of creative ideas on, images that um, grab my attention, images that scare me, images that I feel connection, connection to. Uh, so I have this sort of repository of images that I'm drawing from. Uh, I also do a lot of reading, and I don't read about film because I think it's really boring to make movies about movies. Um, I read about spirituality, and I read about feminism, and I read about memory, um, and I read about science and astrology and astronomy and everything that I can get my hands on, uh, anything that's exciting to me. And then I think kind of my practice really is filtering all of these different sources and all of these different types of information through uh, my own sort of personal story, my, because a lot of my work is autobiographical, it's sort of self-reflective. Uh, I filter all of that through my personal story and it comes out as something new and something fresh that relates to, you know, like the work that's in the museum right now relates to ideas of 
um, motherhood, and it really relates to ideas of religion, and it relates to ideas of nature, and all sorts of sort of disparate things that you know anybody else in this room might have a hard time finding connections between. But that's that's what my practice is: is making those connections through this collection of images and words and things that I find interesting. So about how does that practice then um, relate to? Sorry, <laughs> relate to your work in the classroom, or how do you? How does that does it? come out in the classroom or how do you use that practice to kind of inspire or pull things out of students? Sure, so I always, with my students, at least attempt to get them to sort of think outside of that classroom. So, you know, our students are studying all sorts of different art mediums. Our students are studying, you know, in general elective classes. They're in other programs outside of the School of Art and Design and I'm constantly suggesting and, and asking them to think about those things and bring them into their own practice, just like I do. Like I said, I'm pulling things from science, I'm pulling things from you know, Christianity or Buddhism or any other um, religion that I sort of connect to. Uh, and so, so I think, again, it's just, it gets really boring to make videos about making videos and to only be thinking as an artist in an art world because there really is no such thing as an art world. The art world is part of the larger world and we need to sort of be aware of that and be aware of those, again, connections that we can make. So um, I try to do that through the types of projects that I um, invite students to participate in. Uh, I have pretty open-ended projects so they can approach thematically any material that they find interesting and again, in hopes of kind of keeping this cycle going of folks being um, inspired by what inspires them. I'll try not repeating too many things there, but there, I think there's gonna be a lot of echoed statements, especially knowing, knowing uh, the folks that are up here, going through their statements, seeing their work. But a lot of things that Gabby just said are definitely play out. Um, I, I've got a, an ebb and flow in my work. I'm not, transitioning into being a full-time teacher is much different than before I was here. And before it was 24 seven only clay and it was only internal. And this has really allowed, this the eight years here has allowed me to, to switch up and really really go back and analyze what I was doing, what I'm doing now, what my thoughts were then, how my thoughts are now, um, and being able to connect with universals. Um, research is paramount in everything I'm doing. During the school year, I'm reading. Reading, writing, making images, collecting images. I'm constantly databasing, and it's going first, like what Gabby was saying there at the end, is that it's not classifying anything, and knowing that everything that's on this planet is fair game. And if you want to take that down a little bit as an American, we are even, we're a melting pot. So we get to draw on absolutely every rule, every culture, every philosophy that we want. There is a connection based on our upbringing here. Uh, and then from there, then I'm starting to classify that into different types of inspiration and how I'm, I'm building, uh, creating work that utilizes different points of focus each time. Uh, one of my favorite things, I see Krista over there, she's gonna love this. I love going into the library and going into a place, like the, the library, the one that has books that you have to open and there's no scrolling. Um, yeah, what are these things? That there, because I, I do believe part of this is that everything in the world for me is based on the tangible touch. And I think that is how universally we all understand ourselves to then under, well, understand others and our space and place that allows us to understand ourselves through touch. And that's what draw me, draw, drew me to clay originally. Um, but going into the library, I love going to a place where I don't know anything about that subject matter. And that could be going deep into an engineering textbook that I don't understand the mechanics or the, the physics behind it. And I don't necessarily have to. And being able to appropriate, cherry pick these things and come up with a new evolution to create, to get to, to some form of innovation. I think that's, we're all after that in our work. Um, a lot of, like say the last several years has been a lot of practice has been with health and focus on, on mental and physical state of being so that you can have a clear mind, a healthy body, and that has a lot to do with being able to do repetitious activities, making, if you're just drawing a line, that is about, not muscle memory. There's the eye with that, and there's also the hand, and so it's trying to be holistic in my approach so I can stay healthy, stay happy, stay interested, and look at this as a much bigger picture. Life as an artist is really long, and I wanna be able to do this 40, 50 years from now, 
and I'm working in a, in a, a, a studio that has a lot of caustic materials that work against you. Um, and with materials, I'm looking at raw materials, I'm looking at commercial materials, the industry that's like NASA, all the way back to the hobby artist and the commercial readily available things for Michael and finding a way to, for Michael to, to cross over and find innovative uses or easier uses. And with it is, I, I, I'm trying to find inspiration from the digital to then do it in an analog sense. And that's really important when it comes to my practice in the classroom with teaching is trying to get these inspirations from all over the place, but taking it back to some very basic square roots, foundational, fundamental actions that, that are true for all mediums and learning with practice by doing these things over and over um, and allowing the work to then kind of grow on its own, allowing it to evolve by setting up problems and parameters of choices. Google, I think, is the, one of the worst things in this world because those filters, I wouldn't even call them filters. Um, they're still giving you way too much. And so I'm constantly, the, the breadth of research is as wide as I can possibly make it to then narrow it to one, two, or three items to let me, to, to put me in a box so that I can start to find alternative methods. And I think that's where innovation comes from, um, is by reining it in and able to have more freedom and exploration. All right, you're going to find that I give a much shorter answer for most <laughs> things. Um, that's just who I am. Um, but we do share a lot of the same similarities uh, with regard to collecting and cataloging things. Uh, my students will find my folders of inspiration are enormous uh, that I can pull and draw for, for needs in the classroom, for needs when I have a project, because my research will evolve on the next assignment. Uh, I don't necessarily have this big, big thing that's guiding me as a, as a fine artist, if you will, but rather how that particular uh, project or gallery show is uh, pushing me in a certain direction because of the theme. Uh, so the idea of this, this being a, a design process, uh, the, the faculty at my school was uh, really into the idea that you have to be curious about a lot of stuff because you are then selecting and choosing the parts, you know, as, as Brian's suggesting, to, to distill it to exactly what that project needs on that day or that year. Uh, and then, you know, in the, in the classroom, I'm taking the things that I'm doing at, in figure drawing, in uh, landscape painting, and it, it's giving me the confidence to suggest solutions, demonstrate things. So it, it is ultimately fed right back in. Yeah, there's not much left. <laughs> Covers it all. Um, collect. Mine's one big folder. It's not organized. That would be fun to compare. Um, videos, images, web links, sketches, uh, mine and other people's. Um, the, I, I guess as my practice, it, it, there's like two directions that it goes. There's this um, constant repeated failure trying to make something happen. Uh, and that's the, the experimental end of it. It's just repeated false starts, repeated false starts. Um, and then there's the, the more focused version of it where you, there's a little bit more intentionality going into it in the first place and then it's planning how to get to that goal. So it's one's end oriented and the other's front oriented, one's vague, one's explicit. Um, in terms of how I teach and in my classroom, that's one thing that I try to get into all of my classes and, and students who've had me can moan about it on both degrees that some projects you, you kind of have to plan out like really rigorously and then sort of stick to the plan the whole way through. And then others, they're just sort of vaguely open-ended, make it go in a circle. Uh, and then they just look at you funny like, I didn't ever do with that. Um, but, and there's gonna be repeated failures right at the beginning. Uh, and that's the, the all of it works this way, I mean, variations out here. Uh, and to me, that's a big thing, that there's failure is totally part of this process. And ideally, you get to the point where you fail less, but um, yeah, if I, if I look at my started project folder, it's 100,000 times bigger than my finished project folder uh, because it's repeated failed starts. And sometimes you realize that really quick, like 45 seconds in, yeah, just stop, okay, 
those are good days. Uh, bad days are 30 or 40 hours in, and then you kind of realize, yeah, this is going nowhere. Throw that 40 hour experiment out and start over again. And then you kind of rethink, why didn't I start this at the back end and work forward? So I hope my students are smarter than me in that way by the time they graduate, at least. Uh, Plus what they said. <laughs> so um, then the failure was another question that I wanted to talk about because I think sort of the way the education system is set up is we're encouraged not to fail so often, so frequently. It's failure becomes this thing, and I think it's really stressful for a lot of students to work within a system that is encouraging you never to fail and then to make really good work. Because uh, in order to make really good work, you have to fail. Um, so how do you work with the institutional parameters and encourage your students to fail? Um, <laughs> because I, I, I mean, I, I, it's, I, I've actually talked with a lot of artists about this and in schools overseas, a lot of times they'll say things like, well, I just encourage them to be better risk takers. We don't talk about failure in my class because failure is a bad word. Um, so uh, are there ways that you work within the institutional parameters and uh, encourage um, productive failure? Uh, okay, so I have written in my syllabus, or in my syllabi for all of my classes in digital cinema, uh, that those who take greater risks will find those risks rewarded. So I don't necessarily mean that with grades, although probably if I can see you pushing yourself, you're gonna get a higher grade, right? That's definitely part of it. Um, but I think about failure and risk as more of a personal process or a personal trajectory than um, something that has a letter attached to it. So uh, when I think about students failing in my classes, the real failure comes from students that don't push themselves and they, uh, they take the easy road. I guess if I wanna just put it in layman's terms, they take the easy road and they don't cast talent, they don't do any pre-production, they just head somewhere with a camera and shoot what they shoot. And I think that that might be easier in the moment to complete an assignment that way, but when you sort of look down the road four years later or you know three years later when the students are going into 303 and they realize, I've just made the same video 12 times over over the last three years because I didn't take any risks, I never stepped outside my comfort zone, I never stepped out of my dorm room, maybe, in some cases, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, that, that those students are the, are the ones that are doing themselves a disservice, and, and that's the real failure. Taking a risk and having the video not quite turn out the way that they maybe intended, but still doing that pushing means that every time you make a new project, you're pushing yourself that much further, because, and you're learning, you're learning from it, instead of just staying in this easy cycle of getting the work done and turning it in and getting a maybe decent grade, maybe not, um, that's really not helping anybody. And the whole point of all of us being here is to help the students become better artists, but there's really only so much that we can do. Some of that pushing and some of that failing just has to come from them. Uh, success through failure. If you've had a class with me, you know that that is the number one practice that I approach in that classroom. And, but the only way to get there is by hard work and discipline. Uh, and so that's coming back to the original question of d design practices. It's also in the classroom and how I, I about systems, trying to set students up where they're going to fail no matter what they do so that there, no one can escape that so they can feel that failure of a glaze that ran right off because you didn't know how to handle it and I threw you, into the, I threw you on the back end of the process instead of get starting you with the front. Um, so there's forcing failure and then ag again some of these ideas of who really fails the class the only people that fail a classroom with me are somebody that didn't participate, that didn't show, that didn't challenge. And so uh, what I see in the classroom is a lot of people looking for loopholes. What's the fastest way to get something done that checks the boxes, that allows me to move on? That's a failure. That's a failure to even engage with the core concepts that are being delivered. Um, how to celebrate it in the classroom? 
you could have, a student could have a singular object on one end of the table that could have every element of professional quality finish. And that is not necessarily any better than the student that gives me a shard pile of hundreds of pounds of materials that were processed, fired, broken, they fell apart, they realized they couldn't pinch, they couldn't roll, they couldn't coil, they couldn't roll a slab, even when given the equipment. Um, that's what I'm after in my first one and 200 levels are I want shard piles because the conversation that comes from that far exceeds that one piece at that level. And so it's forcing people to develop practice. And for me, that's systems. And that's creating a methodology of working that allows you to have trial and error. Educated guesses, the entire scientific process of discovery has to be incorporated in the art making practice. So that you're setting up the like, empiric data. And that's what we, you cannot give someone empiric data. I think that can only be found. And so empiric data is ultimate truth Based on a based on an action, so there's what is believed to be true, and then there what is said to be true in textbooks. Most a lot of students like to just do the what's said to be true. There's merit in that because you're learning sk foundational skills and knowledge. But if you're not taking in belief structures and willingness to try that, right, push push the envelope, try and take a great risk. Um, you can't just do that either. I look at those where you have to analyze, you have to step back and be able to analyze those where those two areas overlap. And it's that piece in the middle that's empiric. The textbook said it, but you had a belief, you, 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 did an, you did an experiment, you had an hypothesis, you ran the experiment, and then you had this result. Well, that result is now concrete information that you're then becomes a building block to expand that Venn diagram and continue growing. thinking about whether it's passing or failing, you're just thinking about gaining some kind of knowledge that you couldn't get unless you do something, right? Mm -hmm. Is that my, is that right? That's or a pretty good synopsis. Yeah. And, and really, I don't think that's something that I can impart, like, deliver yeah. it right to the student. Yeah, right. It is something they have to go through the process, go through the experimentation. And for me, I, I put that in the classroom at the 200 level. They've got some skills through the 100. 200 level, I throw a 30 portrait assignment at them that they have to do in a month. So it, it forces failure because you can't put eight hours into each piece. There's no way uh, that it literally forces them to try all these other media and color uh, experiments to figure out what's going to work for them for the final parts of the course, but also three, four hundred and when they're out of here. Uh, so that uh, for me has seen, I've seen so much change in the students after that trying to find a 100 level comparable, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, but that really is the, my favorite project because it does turn the corner for a lot of students in terms of where they're going, because they have done that a bit. Yeah, well, and, and they're, you're asking them to work with materials that they're not comfortable with. So you're not asking right. them to do the same thing over and over and expecting right. a different result. You're saying, well, this is the, the, sto this is the idea store, and you have to use all of these different yeah. things. Um, the subject is almost the same as a portrait, mm -hmm. and they have to throw 12 other different ideas at it to see how it's going to work, whether it's going to work. And so at the end of that, there are probably uh, students who are unhappy right, with their result, but sure. satisfied <laughs> with probably some portion of it. So it, it's kind of like life, right? 50-50. <laughs> it um, is. It works better as a collection, usually, because it does show their Evolution shows the thinking maybe with a material that they were uncomfortable with, unfamiliar with, and uh, at the end, there's probably five in there for everyone that can stand sort of on their own, but not as much as a project that we have spent two or three weeks on. It really is about methodology on it, uh, how, to, how to think through the experiment. I guess I like scaling failure. Like, uh, in from from a teaching standpoint, uh, I'm not big on setting up like a 100 level class to have failure because if you don't understand what the media is in the first place, you don't even know whether that was a failure or success. 
And so then you're left with, well, he didn't like it, so I guess it's failure, but that dude on Instagram loved it, so it must be success, and it's just really confusing at that point. I like my seniors to fail epically. I like uh, 100 levels to have like little tiny micro failures that you can resolve in moments, seconds, uh, and then their failures can get bigger as they go. When, when you understand uh, the kind of the domain that you're working in or the aesthetics of what you're working in, understand the media that you're working in, then you know when something didn't result in, in a product that you would say successful, whatever the heck that even means, but you wouldn't say successful, but what can you pull out of that that was valuable? Uh, but you have to have a, to me, you have to have a context of understanding before you do that. So my one hundreds, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of little tiny things that you're doing the whole time, but none of them individually will make a project just be a disaster. My seniors, I deliberately have some projects that, anybody in here, okay, at least one. First two projects are set up deliberately as experiments, and they might be epic failures, and they're set up that way uh, to encourage them to try something way out of the comfort zone and, and see what happens with it. Um, so, yeah, scaling failure. Um, I, I'm thinking too about uh, this idea of um, what what failure might mean, or or how people in the room might understand uh, your process. Is it an inquiry, or or like if you're making work, is it is it staged as an inquiry or a transformation? Like you're trying to transform all of this research, or trying, or or you have a particular question mind. Could it be both? Um, or wh like, what is the point of practicing so much? Like, what is what is the m drive or the motivation for you to practice so much? Um, and this can be whoever wants to start. I'm gonna keep my. I promise I'll keep this this one short. <laughs> it's gonna be the easiest. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> with with that, uh, it back to the uh, loopholes comment. Uh, there's always cheat codes with everything. And then we, we have to de kind of de define is when aesthetics and especially integration with, with processes and or specific medium, um, trying to establish what the aesthetic is that you're going for and knowing whether it can be achieved through a quick process or a long one. And so I'm, I'm always exploring materials, set up, setting up experiments to find surfaces, textures, materials, line qualities that speak to what I want but trying to expedite my workflow so that all the other things that are the most important to take the long road, it allows me to do the long road. Because anytime I've tried to, in terms of creating a line on a form, if I've taken, if I'm looking for a loophole to make it faster, the work inevitably ends up unsuccessful or not as successful as the other pieces because there's something forced, contrived, or it's missing something authentic about the active participant of the material. So my practices are there to help me establish which where I can gain minutes back in order to put those into another place for the longer road. I'd rather take the 21 steps to do one thing instead of the two and be done before dinner because of that, the quality of the overall product. I mean, it's sort of in there. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's, a, it's an investigation for me. Um, ultimately, the skill will come the more you do it. Uh, but if the thinking isn't present in that moment while I'm looking at something, then I'm not going to connect it later on. Um, so I, um, I do the plein air painting, and those are the memories from those trips or, you know, two hours over at Prescott. Prescott those are the things I remember. I can picture them. I can, if I've been doing a painting, I can hear the music even that it was playing almost. Um, so there, there's a greater connection to what I'm trying to do in that moment rather than, you know, trying to render an eye better. It's not about that. So in a way, it's like kind of that work is indexable. It goes back to that moment in the studio where you're trying to solve something. Yes. It, it does contribute to that, that critical eye when you're trying to solve a problem, whether it's going to be in the classroom or on my own work. break up into um, some of your work and ask you just some questions about uh, just specific ways that you're working. 
Uh, this, I'm going to start with you, Stephen Hughes, because this is your image behind you. Uh, so just thinking about you, you're a lot of the a lot of the work that you've talked about today. This isn't actually you, but it's your work. Um, a lot of the time we've talked today, you've been talking about really physical processes. Um, is there a difference when you're working physically versus digitally in your in your studio practice? Because some of your work seems like it's pretty digital, and a lot of it seems really physical. Um, is there a sort of difference in how you're thinking, uh, or or in that indexical quality of the work, uh, based on the technology or lack of technology or or physical material that you're using? I don't think I approach stuff that's done digitally differently. Really, uh, it really is. If you can paint there. You can do some painting digitally. You're just maybe not familiar with some of the, the brush settings and stuff like that, stuff like that. But rather, I'd say really 90% of my work is traditional paint or charcoal or something on paper. Uh, the digital work is a lot of photography. Uh, you know, this piece has at least five pictures used to create it. You know, so it's not just one model shot. Um, so it's assembling all that in a believable way. It's definitely um, assembling some of the other pieces here with Photoshop layers, uh, but it's not necessarily a, a switch that I have to turn off and on. It, does, it, does it facilitate you working faster? Does it slow you down in some cases if you're not as familiar with the technology? Like, could that be just as sort of a prompt for failure? Well, Photoshop gives you too many ways around the problem. I, I definitely could lose an entire evening or day toggling something on and off to, to kind of experiment with it, but it does, uh, it does kind of lead down a rabbit hole where I might have had a better idea if I just kind of worked it out over here on paper. I think the goal is to always match those up as much as I can and make the students eventually get that sort of comfort level with solving a problem for my class or solving a problem for a client that also uh, scratches their artistic itch. Uh, so the, the pieces mostly up here do veer towards gallery, but uh, usually there's a theme, uh, so it's not necessarily just me sitting in a corner somewhere trying to come up with an idea. I've been given a, a prompt to kind of work off of and find a solution to it. Uh, well, this is my daughter and wife. A little more personal, but it was to reinterpret the uh, Madonna and Child. So trying to find a way to do it contemporary. Um, I, I mean, I think that's great. So the thinking about the, the problem aspect is sort of like an assignment, right? Are there, are you simultaneously working on both of those things all the time? Or are you, do you dis reserve a time in your schedule for just client work and you work on other stuff, you know, during the school year or is it just like a mix match of both of those things all the time? I can't control when the client stuff or the gallery yeah. invitations get in my inbox. Uh, this summer for the last few years has been more personal in terms of going off and playing paint air painting plain air painting, rather. Uh, so that has been a little bit freeing in, in the mind that I don't have to meet anyone else's goals other than my own. Uh, I have given myself challenges, though, within that. To, uh, I was looking at a figure drawing that had a lot of uh, negative space in between the painting and the line. Uh, so I had that in my mind when I went out and tried to do a painting. Uh, and I think it was one of the better ones I've done. So ultimately, giving myself an occasional prompt, even to go find something out there has been, 
I, I think, a good connection between what I'm used to doing and what I've just sort of go off there and sit and paint what I see. It's not just represent exactly that. I can, I can mold it or shape it a little bit and be a little bit more interpretive with how the viewer is going to receive it eventually. And that brings you kind of down a new, new road maybe that you wouldn't have traveled Right. Before. It does. It, rather than just repeat the same process that I had been going through, throws another wrench into it. And, and that ultimately helps me in the classroom as well. It depends. It's, I have uh, James Gurney's blog on my, it's always open on my uh, internet browser. So I pretty much refresh it every day. I, I see what he's doing because he has my dream job. He oh, literally boy. just goes around and paints and he teaches then a little bit. He did Dinotopia. Yeah. Um, so that's what he's really famous for. Uh, he's written a couple of books that one of them I require in my class. Uh, but it, it really is traveling around the world, <laughs> traveling around the country and finding kind of mundane situations like we've got a, he's in a waiting room for, uh, I think that was for tires or something, yeah. and has an hour to kill, does a painting right there. Uh, that sort of spontaneous kind of find something interesting in that moment to remember, I think is really a great kind of approach. Uh, other times the, the piece with the fabric, the Judith piece, uh, Rydell, that one. I had no idea that that was in my head necessary, but it was when I did my portrait of my wife and, and daughter because of the fabric down there. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have it open at all, but I, I've loved that painting. It's always in my, like the main inspiration folder that I go back to occasionally. Uh, but I didn't have anything necessarily open there. Other ones I'm looking at brush mark, brush making, brush mark making, and, and how they're handling their paint uh, because figurative work is definitely where I focus at this point, uh, whether it's you know, the open draw sessions that I hold, uh, or it's finding a way to get it in the paintings. Uh, that is, that's my main research. So more yeah. the formal qualities than the conceptual qualities or like the subject qualities. Although huh. the subject, you're saying is sort of mundane, like there are things to be made with in every boring situation. Right. Um, The, the sort of uh, psychological aspect behind her portrait here, mm -hmm. that's definitely something I, I look for as well. Okay. Uh, but a lot of it's pain handling. Okay. Because I feel like I'm still getting better at that. Yeah, well, I think that's the he's great, great at color too. Right, You're, we're always growing. There's, we, we always have to start somewhere, I think, and that is something I think you don't necessarily think of, right? You think of all the things you don't know. As a student, a lot of times you think of all the things you don't know, and it's so, di like, how do I start? Because I don't know anything, or I don't know this. And it's, it's just like being able to start wherever you're at and realizing that there is always so much more to learn. Um, and so, like, you saying that is that truthful nugget of, like, we can always handle something better. We can always find a more eloquent solution, a different mm -hmm. solution, a different way of the workaround, a way of working. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you're passionate about that, it, that never gets old. I was telling my students the work in the show right now is my pretty much my open draw sessions. Yeah. It, uh, it amazed me looking back at, because I, I went all the way back to when I was hired. It was just sitting in the, in the room there. And I started to wonder, how in the hell did I get hired? Because the work at the beginning is so <laughs> bad compared to where it is now. <laughs> so I hit it well, I guess.
change, like uh, in other words, the evolution or transition. Uh, has everything to do with the work, and that comes back to us as people, as humans in the world that we interact, things that we have control of, things we don't have control of. Um, I like systems because in, in my world, I've had a host of medical problems that I had no control of at a really early age, and it was either let it take, let, let it stop you, or just move on. And so that means problem solving and coming through with it. So I like um, that in the work itself, it's always about transitions of lines. Do they start, are they sharp or are they smooth? And they're, they're from geometric into organic. It's just like how we interact with people, whether it, it's uh, physical, emotional, uh, all of these things are constantly, the world is constantly changing, we're changing, technology changes, we go back and forth between the digital, the analog, but right now we're kind of, there's a revolution to come back to the analog because people are realizing how much technology <laughs> has removed us from humanity. Again, the sense of touch. Um, so it's about being, to, being able to adapt and not have a roadblock be a wall you can't get past. There's always a way over, under, around, finding solutions to problems and that, that deals with change and that change is inevitable. Um, and, and clay, for, for me, is a, is, a, is a really important material because there is a bit of control and then a bit of natural response, natural character, nat natural personality. And so again, it's about interaction of more than one element so that you have to engage change. You have to engage, this could be in the commercial industrial world where you have the best laid plans of mice and men, but you don't have the, the, the fiscal uh, capabilities or the time or the equipment to do it. So you've got to come up with a solution that fits the problem here and now. And that's just identical in the classroom. Students usually have, make conjecture all day long and they overthink a problem that makes them not finish on a deadline because they don't really want to engage with that other force that forces change. And thinking about that, like this is, like clay is pretty malleable, right? Before yeah. you fire it, you have all this opportunity. It's, the most, it's plastic arts, how the rest of the world refers to it as plastic arts, not ceramics. You can't, you can't control it completely. And I think if you try to, you end up failing in a different kind of way. If, and that failure can result in the tangible cracks, warping, glazes, chipping, slaking, shelling off, or uh, there's also the other side of that um, where forcing something to be usually comes up contrived. You can see that it is not natural. It's against everything you set out to do. It doesn't have the correct feel. Um, and so I think that's being, again, being an, allowing a material to be an active participant to be able to find that, find what's natural that allows an, a, a natural evolution to occur, not one that is forced or, or has a time frame on it. So in some respects, there has to be some element of sort of chance or malleability on the part of both the material and the maker um, that you're, you're working with. When you start your process of making, are you thinking about um, site or are you thinking about this is going to be something that's going to be indoor, something that's going to be outdoor? Um, is it how accessible it is or not? Do, do you design for site or do you design to work through a problem or a, find a solution for something? Or is it a bit of both? Like how does that process unfold? It, it can ebb and flow. There can be a lot of different stages of that. By and large, I'm in the studio making work for myself to, to, to get into that state of being that allows me to tap into the subconscious so I can solve my own problems. Now those problems are, are inherently connected to other people's problems and questions out there too. And I'm not making work in response to my own problems. I am setting out and making work that is in response to my research, to other artists around the world that are publishing work and they're doing something that's changing a paradigm or an understanding of material or what could be. And so I'm incorporating that into my problems, uh, but it is, and it is not, I don't like to do commissions. I try to stay away from those. I don't like to work with other people. I don't need their input. They're usually incorrect or they're coming from their own <laughs> sense of perception that has nothing to do with mine and I don't need that getting engaged with it. Um, so yeah, the commission's not, I, I, they're dreadful. Um, I, I don't, the work, I'm working at the scale that I need to, when I need to, to deal with either the materials I'm deciding to experiment with uh, or maybe it's a residency and I know that there is a, a context of a physical environment I have to work within so that I'm gonna let that guide possibly scale, but not a direction of design. Design I am finding through a system of molds that I've created that are modular 
And that system is based in um, rational and irrational numbers that go all the way back to the Greeks and how we understand our design itself, human design, how the proportions of us are growth formulas down to that of a plant or a tree where we have these same systems that we are all hardwired to understand. And so I take these proportions, I apply them to the molds, and that allows me to be free in the moment as I find the work. So I start with a gesture that, that goes back to uh, studying Japanese and, 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 and calligraphy. So I'll have a gesture that I then try to apply on an X, Y, and Z axis. So I can try and engage that gesture in the totality of a piece. And, that, and, it's, and it's an additive and subtractive process that I don't have a drawing of exactly what it's going to be, I leave that for when I'm making pots, when I need to know a contour line. To, but outside of that, I want to be in the moment finding it present. And that deals, again, back to the things that I'm studying and researching and, and going to other countries to find is uh, Hinduism is one of my greatest loves right now to against Christianity and Catholicism because of how open it is and the different structures and, and layers that there are to it. Uh, and I'm trying to, to, as that is developing to my way of thinking, I'm trying to create up systems that allow me to be present. So be present, allow for openness. Um, and, and you're talking about these specific forms that are not really specific, but have a specific relationship back to the history. Um, and then thinking about uh, re responding to the material with the form and these sort of architectural or uh, conceptual ideas and, and being malleable in the moment. Um, how 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 is this then sustainable? How do you how do you how how is that practice sustainable? Or how do you use um, sustainability? Could you talk about that a little bit too? Um, through these ideations and forms, sustainability in the sense of like, maybe materials, but maybe also thinking about us as like global artists and and traveling all over and how how are certain how has sustainability crept into your work through these travels or different experiences the sustainability it, it is an important idea uh, it starts usually with raw materials and what am i doing with them i'm trying to not just burn dollar bills and pour materials down the sinks with failures i'm trying to find ways to like i'll, I'll take a sculpture that doesn't work and i will sit there as a form of meditation and or uh, punishment to turn that back into dust with a hammer and then, then that material is going to be hand wedged back into the next piece. And so there's an evolution and con continuity of the energy that was put in that I want to carry on and give it a new life. Um, so I am always looking at ways of whether it's hand digging clays, uh, finding a lot of people up here in the UP has been exciting with private properties on, uh, on, on, the, on the lake shore to be able to acquire these local materials and turn those into the glazes. And everything that's in the DeVos right now is, is all UP based materials and so I'm looking at a way to just harness what is here without having to go to the, all the corporate entities to deal with shipping and all of that and it's not to to be gaining it's to try and offset all of those carbon that carbon footprint I've created by jet setting and so it's trying to just get back to maybe square one uh, so that I'm not adding any more than, than what I'm taking so I'm trying to find a, a harmony there. So then, like with some of these really big works that we're seeing there, I think they were from China. Mm -hmm. um, are you bringing these back with you, or no? Are that they this or, we, this I mean, was for kind of this was for a civic center uh, in Yangmian, uh, which is outside of Huping, which is in the Xi'an district of China, the core of the, the, the Silk Road. Uh, and this was for um, basically Lear's Chinese competitor for an aviation company that builds airplanes. Uh, they were attracted to the sensibility of line and the design sense, and it spoke to the forms that inspire me, airplane wings, engine, boat hulls, all those things. Um, and so these, so I'm, again, I'm trying to do projects, residencies where I'm leaving the work. Yeah. And it's not, if it's a cost neutral, meaning that myself and the entity, the residency center, the university, wherever I'm doing that work, is that it's at least a break even for both of us and that leaving that piece so it stays there. I'm not trying to shift these because the cost, the time, the frustrations, and all the people in between, middlemen suck. Um, so I'm trying to leave that piece there to, again, promote that exchange, that co the concept of exchange. And for lastly, your last question for the moment, at least, um, thinking about some of your influences, can you speak to your influences that you 
Because I hear they change. Um, do they change depending on site or location? Like when you sent me the email, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. Well, <laughs> Site and location by default is going to. I, I don't know if I, I think I'd have to leave here um, to assess it later because I know what I'm doing now is processing previous 10 years of travel's work. And I, I'm still trying to figure out what was good, what worked, what didn't, what, so trying to gleam information. So it's always about this, I'm researching now for the next 10 years. I'm always planning ahead. Projects themselves in my studio are, are one to three years out with lectures and workshops. So it's always a big picture there. I am uh, very much uh, influenced by our, our coastal line up here, and that is the uh, cross contours that we see from wind currents on the beach and how every day, my favorite spot is, I, I go to nearly every day, is uh, uh, Songbird Trail. And anybody that heads out out there, in the last three years, the beach is almost gone and it's in constant evolution and changing. And those forms that are, are, are very brief, they're, they're impermanent. I'm trying to get that energy and capture that and give it, I'm basically I'm trying to get a, uh, uh, a gestural, I'm trying to give tangible form to a gesture. And I am gaining new identities and insight to that through these coastal sand and snow and ice formations interaction with the wind. And so a lot of that is directing the work. In some ways you're feeling up here sort of that's Adding to right yep, now, yep. and that it's going to show itself a little later on. And then with this ice, this was this is what led to the work that I'm currently creating. I'd say the last ten years of work comes out of this one notion, uh, and this is dealing with uh, Hein Bisler from uh, Zurich, and uh, really mid 20th or 20th century uh, architectural design, in specifically in shell structures and concrete. Uh, and where like Hein Bisler really got to this expansion and the, to understand the full capabilities of concrete and how that has, uh, has these buckings of fuller and sangri and geodesic design, uh, inherent strength of raw materials deals with how materials lay. And so this top image is, uh, uh, these are things that I, I put in the classroom and made people run this. That is a piece of uh, burlap that is just natural by itself, unadulterated, hung up on its pieces and you have this natural lay. And it's then pouring plaster on that to let it set in what is a natural curve. That plays into things like the parabolic, parabolic arch that's in St. Louis. Um, that comes back also into kiln designs because those that natural curve, like what the material wants to do when it comes to an arch, <laughs> speaks directly to how air and flame move in a kiln and getting temperatures even and controlled or, or uneven if that's what you want to do. So this deals with understanding materials and that's directly in the classroom as well that even though I set students up for failure, like that, that is the goal, but I'm doing it in a controlled sense where there is a control point that allows them to, even the worst like hands-on person that has no dexterity whatsoever, they can still have success with these basic formats that they're going through uh, so you're learning in that trial and error. Uh, but it's teaching them what the materials do so that once we engage concept, they have a greater understanding of the relationship between those two things. And coming to not forcing material. When I try and create a curve, I'm trying to let the material do what it does naturally and I'm an active participant working with it rather than saying, this is a perfect curve. That's already contrived because I've already had a finite end to what was. I'd rather find it in the, in the act. Well, and I think, you know, a lot of the things that we're all, that we're talking about are all interconnected, right? So there's this layer of, like, your inspiration, but then that layer of uh, materials and how they work and how they mimic your material, your inspiration, your, your conceptual inspiration. There's these, like, many layers. And I think that that um, leads me to Steve's work, uh, the other Steve, uh, <laughs> Steve Larson's work. Uh, but this is a still from work that's on display in the gallery right now. Um, I, and I feel like this work is so shiny and lovely. And, um, but if you don't know how it's made, uh, it might be lost on people in, in some ways, right? So it's this great thing. It's, it tells a story. It, it's, it's animated. You put all this effort into it, and it makes it look so seamless and um, perfect. But how, like, sort of how does 
how does that work? Do you start with the idea and then you make something like, I, I guess it's like, I feel like if you don't know how it's made, it seems like magic. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how the process that you use to um, make animations? And then, uh, then I'm going to ask you about the context. Yeah, the process is, um, yeah, I use a computer. Some software stuff, like buttons, things. Like right, that's just a, a tough question because yeah, it, yeah. it'd be like asking Brian that thing you did. How'd you do it? There, there's so there's so many layers to it. I just I happen to be using a computer to do it. Or using it. software, but um, it's a it's a tool. It's got more buttons than a brush does, but yeah. what you're inventing, like, so you have this idea and then. You're not a, I'm, I'm struggling to, to answer the question because it's, it's like yeah. speaking to a, to a, uh, how does that happen, yeah. you know, it's, it's a computer, it's a magic box, you click a button, everything just spits out exactly and the way you want. It right? looks so easy, but I know it is so difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a great, there's a, a, there's this great polar thing with computers in the arts uh, that we, that still hasn't been resolved and I've been in it long enough that it used to be a little more painful than it is now, uh, that there's like half these people are saying, well, it, it's, it's not really, it's not really valid. It's not really good. It's not really interesting because you do it with a computer and the computer does so much of the work. And then the exact same person three hours later would be saying something like, well, there's so many things you can do in the computer. It's too complicated. Can't do it. So, well, if it's magic, then you don't have to do the work, but it can't be too complicated to not be able to, it's like uh, very, two, two ideas butting heads against each other. Uh, it, it's ultimately, it's just a, another tool that you figure out how to use, you know, so I practice using software and do hundreds of sketches, uh, and he uses pencil and charcoal and paint and clay, and you know, so it's, it's yeah. Similar. See it as being that dissimilar. Yeah. Yet the, the, the tool obviously isn't as portable. Well, okay, a laptop is. It's not as portable. It requires electricity. It requires a different kind of light and so on. But uh, ultimately, it's just a it's just another tool for making stuff. So thinking about the concepts of this work, it's pretty. This it's pretty emotional. I feel like the um, <laughs> the work that you have in the gallery. If you haven't seen it, you should really watch it. It's quite emotional. I saw. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to make a, a piece like that and not consider the audience a little bit. I mean, when, when, when I'm making animations and I know that uh, I'm not making animation just to sit on my computer, it's going to be displayed somewhere. And if I'm going to be displaying something somewhere, there's audience involved. And if there's audience involved, uh, there needs to be some consideration of that audience. Uh, am I putting language in it? Can I read it? That's a very minimal thing. Am I putting audio in it? Can they hear it? Uh, am I using symbols, gestures, signifiers that people are going to understand? Is there a narrative? Isn't there a narrative? So audience is a consideration all the time uh, in that type of work. Uh, if audience wasn't a consideration, I wouldn't show it to anybody. It would just be my, on my computer or wall or whatever, and I would be the audience. Your home screen. Yeah, I'd, I'd be the folk artist at that point, too. So, um, But that's not, that's not where I'm working. So yes, audience is important, and the response to it is important. So how do you stage a narrative? Uh, in this case, I would say it's mostly a narrative. Uh, how do you stage a narrative to go through the, the way that you inform a viewer and let them get engaged with 
whatever the character is, whether it's a couple of tongues that come out of the ground or whatever. If you haven't seen it, that should it's not a big spoiler, but there's tongues that come out of the ground and then they have sex. <laughs> but, um, the, the kind of ebb and flow to, to lead somebody to whatever the outcome is, a climax of the story, uh, or uh, kind of a twist at the ending, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, that, that's standard, just sort of a narrative structure. Right. Um, Gabby can do the exact same thing, you just might be doing it with video. Uh, it's storytelling. Uh, yeah, yeah, multiple panels of a, of, a, of a comic do the exact same thing. So it's very, very old storytelling. But then thinking about how your spin on this, right? So we, I talked about, I opened up with this technology question that was just like too much. It's like we would need to be here for like a master course. Um, but then also this this work is is conceptually about technology in some ways, right? So, oh yeah, so it's, it's like anti-technology there's this, there's technology. Sort of double <laughs> layer, this layering of, of technology. It, does your work often grapple? Um, uh, it has much more over time. Um, if, if I go back and look at my work, so I was giggling when I heard him talking about going back and looking at his early figure drawings, like, what the hell? So I, I do the same thing periodically, I go back and look. Like, I remember making this and thinking that at the time, and not so much now, but um, it, increasingly over time, due to changes in the world, changes in my brain, changes in my life, um, the way I analyze things differently, synthesize things differently. Uh, I have kind of in, in increasing, and if you've read the statement related to the piece, uh, quandaries with like making work with a piece of technology that's kind of half detrimental to the planet at the same time. Um, and so I, I find it very fun to make something about the thing that's criticizing the thing that I'm making it about. If you follow that, it's this big loop kind of does this Mobius strip that just keeps going over and over again. Very self-referential kind of thing that I'm probably the only one who gets, but that's fine. Uh, so as long as the narrative makes sense, that subtext isn't necessarily as important. But um, yeah, that kind of rambled off there a little bit. But yeah, that. It's, it's, like, it's, it's complex because there isn't a solution, right? Right now, there's not a yeah. solution that's like well, dying well, the, out. There's like, two solutions. Yeah. Yeah, embrace the technology, destroy the world, and we'll have a great hundred years, and then and then everybody will die. Or get rid of the technology, and everything will last a long time, but we'll be miserable in the meantime because nobody wants to dig the ground with a plow. Right, right. I mean, we can't take care of it. We won't be able to eat. And eat. Well, yeah, our three quarters would die. That's that's part of it too. So there's a give and take. So then, is this work because it's about technology and how it's sustainable or it's not sustainable? How it's how it sort of seems chaotic to people who don't understand it, but seems very much like a tool for people who do understand it. Is the work about chaos and control to some degree? Does, does through the work, do you find control? Is it way of like exercising control in some way or, or managing chaos or? Jeez, such deep thoughts. Um, no, it's, an, it's not really about managing control because I don't think like if, if I can't manage my thoughts about those kinds of concepts, um, for me, making the work about it isn't going to suddenly give me control. Anxiety. If anything, it would create more anxiety about it. Um, <laughs> so th it, it's, it's irrespective of it. It just happens to be um, where my brain is right now in terms of telling stories. Uh, because there's, and, and part of that's working in this domain and there's so much animation that is and I'll, I'll just throw the whole industry because it ends up being like the movies and special effects and video games, all that kind of lumped into it. Uh, and, and it all can, can portray technology in a glorious, glorious way. You know, all of science fiction does that. I'm very much a fan of all of that. Uh, and then simultaneously, I would really like to not touch technology for like a month and go get lost in a mountain and you know, go to the bathroom and a hole in the ground kind of deal. But, okay, maybe not that smart. But, but that also it, ha that happens. Is that, is that important to your process is it important that you do personal and then client based work that you take you check out and you have this sort of yeah. time where you're not uh, at a computer all the I, time I, I was thinking about the the kind of personal and client work aspect of all this and it uh and i, I had waves where i was doing tons of client work uh 
commission work. Uh, and more recently, in the last couple of years, I've kind of phased out of that. Um, mostly, and, and it wasn't from lack of desire to do it, because there's a different sort of impetus with client work. Uh, very deadline driven, uh, so you can't overthink things. Um, when I was working with a lot of clients, uh, I became a very fast animator, because you, you don't have the luxury to take time doing it. Uh, now, sometimes things didn't work out perfectly, but you become very fast at doing it and, and hitting those deadlines. And what I didn't like about that uh, as it kind of evolved, it isn't that all clients are jerks, although some certainly are. I'm not gonna just say all, though. Get to clients, man. Um, but that um, as, as, as I got into it, that deadline thing always uh, supplanted, in some cases it, it supplanted teaching. And kind of first and foremost, uh, and if working with a client has a negative effect on that, then it, it, at this time, that's something I'd step away from. So the, that kind of client aspect has faded a little bit uh, recently. Um, not that it's not going to come back, but it's got to be in a manageable time frame. But they always come and say, yeah, in two weeks, can we have a 33-minute animate? And that has this, this, and this. And yes, I'll just drop all my other lights and, and do the project. Um, so, in relation to that work, uh, in an, that kind of work just kind of actually evolved out of a lot of the client work that I did over the years with medical companies, uh, and some of my ideas changed while working with them, because the technology level that medical companies and medicine work with is completely insane and completely violent and completely random, like, we're using drugs, they work, we don't know why, and this other thing grows out of your ear when you do it, but they work, they solve your problem and then we're gonna use a laser to fix the thing that comes out of your ear. So it's kind of a, a, a fun little world to look at from a technology standpoint. Uh, but then pause for a second and think that that's actually happening inside of my body somewhere. And, it, and, it's, and I'm doing animations of them doing it on other people, which is great because I can be one step away, but then I imagine that being in me and yeah, my brain melts again. And so I make an animation about squashing flowers. So that did influence your personal work? Oh yeah, on a level for yeah. sure. The technology aspect of it, definitely. So this this will maybe be my last question for you for now, so you can. Uh, is I I just grabbed a whole bunch of screenshots, um, and this seems like such a wide variety of work. Uh, uh, for and, and so I'm wondering, so you're using a wide variety of software, you're creating a wide variety of things. Is there is there some way that you choose what you're going to do? Uh, yeah, like things that you've heard already. Sometimes they are like uh, you just sit down and uh, yeah, Yoda would be fun to do. And I think Yoda should be taking this out of himself because let's update Star Wars a bit. Um, so sometimes it's just a quirky idea and you just bang it out for the sake of doing it. And it maybe it turns out good, maybe it ends up in the junk folder. Uh, and other cases it's, it's much more directed. But uh, on, on a certain level, it's just wanting to create stuff. And I don't think that it always has to have an agenda. You don't always have to have a destination. It goes back to where I started, that it's not like you start out sometimes just by failing. Uh, and so these are things that happen to turn out a little bit better, uh, but some of them don't have anything particularly profound or thoughtful about them. It's just, oh, that was cool. And well, it's like making things appear in reality, like having an idea and making it tangible. Right, same, same way you might on a piece of paper and you, you make it tangible. So it's, it's some of those, those are all just basically just sketches that kind of evolved into something that looked a little better and so they, they stuck around. Yeah. Um, the fails get into there. You don't want to see the first Yoda. It was, <coughs> it looked way more like R2-D2. So, so speaking so. of fails, uh, for all of you, uh, when you fail, and these are some of Steve's influences, and I think that you can Like make them like a tangible like yes 
this is my uh... uh well because i'm working digitally I, yeah i i hold on to all of them um because even the the whole point to, to go back to if you're setting yourself up for failure and talking about discussions of students failing not talking about grades uh every time you, you fail at something you actually learn by doing it and right. that, that's why failure is critical it's like uh, I fell over because I didn't stick my foot out in front of me, and now I know that in order to walk, I need to stick my foot out in front of me. So there's, there's value in all of that, and uh, I keep all of those because somewhere down the road, uh, there might actually be a way to revisit that. Somewhere down the road, there might be an actual application for that. Uh, somewhere down the road, I just might want to go back uh, and review it and kind of skim through those, like going through an old sketchbook and saying, what was I thinking? Oh, actually, there, there's a nugget here that's actually really good. I forgot about that. Uh, and you did it six, seven, ten years ago or whatever. So yeah, I totally save them for that reason. I get a little envious about it as a sketchbook because I can flip through all of my sketchbooks for ideas much faster than like opening up computer files. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit slower to browse, but the, the principle is the same. Yeah. So yeah, I hold on to the, the majority of the failures. If they're an epic fail like in the first 20 seconds, no. But if I put in enough time to call it worth saving, which is generally about 15 minutes, uh, then I'll save it. And Degrees of failure. I have a, a star system for <laughs> how bad the fail, fail is. Yeah. 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 How about if you failure? Do you hold on to them? Yeah. Do you hold on to your failures? <laughs> I rock them to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> my failures exist in word form as opposed to video form. So there are lots of ideas or sort of conceptions of ideas that don't really go anywhere. Um, I have a folder on my desktop that is, that is um, basically just like new work, things that I want to make. And I can usually tell if I haven't started making one of those things within a couple of weeks of getting the idea for it, I'm not going to. So uh, making movies, you know, much like making animation is so much so much pre-production and so much forethought has to go into it before you're actually holding the camera and making the work that, uh, that yeah, if my heart's just not in it, if, my, if I can't wrap my head around how to actually make it, um, it usually just stays as the text document on my computer. You should make a video about whatever it is. <laughs> I'm not gonna give away my secrets. <laughs> whatever the things are that are sort of interesting but not interesting enough for me to fully pursue because I know I'm going to be dedicating probably months of time into any one project. And uh, if, I, if I don't have the energy or the passion or the drive to do so, I, it sort of stops there. It rarely gets to video form, yeah. So I can talk about, I can talk about, I think you, you use the word relationship and I think sort of my relationship to my work and that's really what my, even more so than being about time, my work is about relationships and the process of those relationships, which I guess anytime you're starting to talk about process, you're talking about time. Um, but so in digital cinema, there really is no way to make work by myself. Even if I'm not making work for a client, I'm, I'm working with tools that someone else invented. I'm working with technology and software that somebody else invented and built for me to use. So I can't just go out into the woods and make a video. Like That just won't work. Um, and so, so there's that aspect of it. I'm using tools that somebody else built. Um, I'm also engaging um, with talent. Uh, I'm engaging with an audience 
and those are both relationships. So the relationship in the process of production with the other people or person that are working with me, the, the crew, the cast, um, if I'm collaborating creatively with anybody else, all of those people are part of that relationship. And then the relationship that comes afterwards, like this group of people that have seen the video work and want to talk to me about it. Um, when I'm doing more performance-based stuff, the audience that's literally sitting right there or standing there, laying there, watching me um, do the performance, um, that's part of the process as well. And so, of course, time plays a really important role in that. Uh, and I think, j I don't think there's an artist in this room that would say that the process of working on a piece doesn't in some way, shape, or form change you also as a person and as an artist. Um, so there's that aspect of time too. And I, I don't have quite the same like range as, as the other people up here. Um, I made my first video as an artist 11 years ago, my first video. So when I look back on the work that I did 11, 10, 10 11 years ago, I'm not looking at when I started my career here, I'm looking at when I started making work. And so I still feel like I've got this huge, you know, <laughs> range of things that I can continue exploring, but but I, I, at this point, I think about time maybe a little bit differently because there hasn't been as much of it, I guess. Uh, so thinking about that, uh, you, you talked about working about relationship, um, and, and it seems like it, in, in some ways it's not just about the relationship with the maker and the audience, it's also about relationships, um, intergenerational relationships within you and your family. So some of your previous work had a lot to do with memory and identity, and I think in some cases, especially in the work in the gallery, that continues in some ways. Um, and, I, and I think that there, in the work in the gallery, you also leave a space of ambiguity in the mm -hmm. work. Um, ambiguity for the viewer, right? So in some cases in the work, I feel like the audience could say, well, this cup is half full, or they could be like, Uh, um, so how, how do you think about the ambiguity that you leave in your work um, now, or, or what does that speak to, or what do you hope for it, or? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so oftentimes when I begin the process, the pre-production, I'm starting to just conceptualize what it is that I want to say or what it is that I want to do. And again, it's uh, very rarely at the beginning is it about this is the deliverable, like this is the thing that I'm going to hand to an audience. It's about getting to that thing. Um, and that's what a lot of my, I, I, I also you know consider myself a scholar and a lot of my scholarly research is about that process and about improvisation and sort of growth through the process of to film or filming as a verb as opposed to a final definitive project, uh, you know, project or thing that you deliver. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when I'm thinking about the process, I think about it much more for me than I do for anybody else. It's about, it's about me working through something. It's about me, um, it's about me. <laughs> it's, it, it's about, it's therapy, honestly. And I, yeah. you know, I could get super anecdotal and talk about, you know, how I've done this as a, you know, as a small child, I would draw pictures of things that scared me because it was a way of me to sort of work out how I was feeling about that thing. And, uh, you know, like drawing, drawing pictures of like vivid nightmares that I would have. And then I could kind of let them go and be like, okay, that's done now, I can move on. And I still work that way. Like all of my pieces are about something that I don't understand completely and I'm trying to get a better grasp on it. So it's about the process way more than it is about what you see in the gallery, yeah, the product. Um, and so I think, for me, if there are elements that are ambiguous to an audience, I don't really care because <laughs> it's way more about it's way more about what I how I feel about it and what I got out of the process of making it than what you know what the people in this room think right. or what they understand. I guess. Yeah. So in this case. Uh So I am a relatively new mom, um, and I say that meaning you know five years ago. 
um, my son, or I guess close to six now, my first child was born, um, the one who is featured as the voiceover performer in the video. And uh, he changed my perspective on a lot of things, obviously, as children are wont to do. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, he, as a parent, at least in my, in my worldview or in my perspective, um, becoming a parent, so much less of your life is about you and about what you want, and it's about them and what they want and what they need. And uh, so there's a lot of really positive things that come from that relationship, but there are also some negative things like talking about climate change and talking about the future of just sort of the world in general and what that means for my child. Not so much what it means for me, but it, what, it, what it means for him or for them, both of them. Uh, and so I, there's, a, there's a part of the video where he says, um, mommy, because of you, I'm fated to die to death. And that's really, that's the core of what this video is about, is about how I made this choice to bring this life into this chaotic world where these insane, terrible things are happening all the time, you know, from the smallest, the smallest version of that, which is these worms that take over these crickets' bodies and cause them to die, um, to, you know, corporations spewing disgusting, you know, chemicals into the air and destroying the world. Um, I brought him into this place. I made that choice to bring him into this place. And I, because of that choice to bring him life, he's also fated to die at some point, whether it's in five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, it's going to happen. And so um, I've been kind of grappling with that idea, um, whereas maybe my early work was more about my own mortality and how I fit into this crazy world. Now I'm thinking about it relationally and how my children potentially fit into this crazy world. So like in this kind of span, it went from like his parents and their legacy and identity to now your children. Mm -hmm. um, but also, that, that you, you know, they're both canvas back to you and your experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this work, I, it seems like sound is increasingly important. Um, like the voiceover using your child is both pretty potent. Um, but also the, the additional sounds really reverberate some of these ideas or intensify some of them, I think, for the viewer. Is that something that you're really focusing on and digging into in a different way than you have in the past? Or or um, was that in, in sort of the sphere of how the work is the sound somewhere? Where, where, where is it in terms of importance? equally as important to the image, if not more so, depending on the work. Um, I, in all of my classes, I teach that sound is uh, just another tool in the toolkit for visual storytelling. Um, there's obviously the, the verbal information that comes through a narrative or through a documentary. Anytime someone is speaking, that is obviously the most important part. Um, there's the visual information that we get through cinematography, through composition, through just the way that the images are delivered to an audience and then there's sound. And the, the biggest difference, in my opinion, between the image and sound is that image is always sort of stuck inside of this container, you know. I'm not working in three-dimensional forms, I'm working in this very flat, you know, plane. And, um, you know, people that, people that are experiencing my videos have to be sitting in front of the screen to be able to hear it, but somebody, if this, if we were, hypothetically watching one of my videos in this room, somebody down the hall could potentially hear the sounds without actually seeing the images and still have that opportunity of the experience. So the sound doesn't really have a container and that's really exciting to me. Um, and I, also, uh, I always have kind of used sound as a way to, in some ways, strengthen the message uh, that the video is trying or the concept that the video is exploring. But I also use sound in ways to, to sort of juxtapose the message of the, of the video or the concept that I'm trying to explore. Um, I just saw my Darren pop yeah, up, so I got excited. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so sound has always been really important, and I, I, in this video, sort of took a step away from thinking about it musically, because I also do a lot of uh, singing vocal performance in my videos, where I compose you know, instrumental music for it. Um, so for this one, I went back to my roots, which is using sound effects and manipulating them and creating a soundscape out of other people's other people's sounds. And so what you're, what you're hearing in that video is an incredibly manipulated group of 20 or 30 different sound effects that I took and kind of combined and distorted. Mm -hmm. So thinking about um, influences, this is the last question, and then I want a 
everybody else would ask questions if you'd like. Uh, your influences, um, so we have two influences for you. Um, would you say that these influences are sort of um, conceptual or uh, are you thinking informal influences in some way? Uh, I thought of the Maya Daring with the sound seemed kind of important. Also the sort of interior exterior experience, like the experience of you, you're trying to make that visible in an exterior way without, with also like simultaneously the understanding that it's an interior experience. So it's like you're seeing it from multiple perspectives. Is that something that you're borrowing or translating or um, interpreting from this work or, or how do your influences work as influences? So I think this might be different than, than how most people would answer this question, but when I started making videos, I feel like I was doing so almost in a vacuum. I had, I grew up in rural Iowa and I had no, beyond you know watching VHS tapes that my parents bought through our movie club, um, I wasn't really exposed to media, especially avant-garde media. So you know, high school was really when I started kind of looking at um, more independent cinema, but I still wasn't really looking at like Maya Darren or, um, or ex what, what one would call experimental cinema. Um, and so the first video that I ever made, I was, I was only able to draw from the influences that I, that I had known, which were you know, blockbuster films and some independent films that I had you know, sought out on my own. Um, it was only after I made my first few videos that somebody said, you should look at Maya Darren because you work exactly in the same vein that she does. And uh, in taking a, you know, my performance class, you should look at the work of um, Marina Abramovich because it, uh, your, your methods of working are very similar to theirs. So I see them less as influences where, oh, I'm gonna pull this concept from Abram Abramovich, or I'm gonna pull this technique from, from Maya Darren. I think of it more as, wow, there are other people in the world that see things the same way that I do and that uh, share things the same way that I do. So it validates my art more so than is, is an in influence in terms of, um, yeah, pulling material or appropriating from those styles. Mm -hmm. in, in the way that was like something about their work resonates inside of, or like lives inside of you. Right, and I didn't even, yeah. yeah, as I was working, like wasn't even aware that that, that somebody else was sort of working in that same vein or had been working in that same vein. It was just, yeah, it, there's something similar about our experiences enough or about the way that we see the world that, um, that we're working simultaneously in, this, in, the, in these you know, disparate but similar mediums. And so much of Abramovich's work, I mean, I've never, I've never seen her perform live, so it's all this performance documentation that I'm seeing, which also I think relates directly to the type of work that I'm doing, which I consider to be nonfiction. Um, even though sometimes it is incredibly performative. Uh, and so I think about my work more as maybe documentation of performance than I do, even including the voiceover and the, and the piece in the gallery, um, than I do any, any, any form of fiction or narrative, really. I just wanted to open this up kind of to all of you. I'm an art education major, and I've been wanting to ask this to a lot of professors. I want to know what kind of aspects of being a teacher you think have um, made you a better artist and vice versa. So what parts of being an artist and working while you're teaching have made you a better teacher as well? successful at any level. Um, so th just that in itself, teaching becomes um, a, an analytical, evaluative, evaluative process within your own work and your own skills and your own ideas and really getting you to, 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 to hash them out and figure out where, what, uh, what is your stance on something. And if you don't have a stance on it, you're also to be open to that in the classroom uh, to promote dialogue, not an argument, a dialogue, a conversation of both sides and how things are seemingly sometimes completely unrelated end up having the same core. And so that's a takeaway for me is when you have conversation with a wide demographic, wide skill sets, wide ages, wide genders, all that, and to get perspective 
again, selfish, right? But I think we're all in this because art is a thing that is an internal as much as it is external. But to gain uh, affirmations of your own beliefs and where you stand and the difference between fact and opinion and belief and, and to, to establish things like empathy and, and a broader breadth of, uh, of global awareness of what's going on in context. Yeah. I would add, um, like over time, um, the, the more I taught, uh, I like to compare the thoughts of the pieces I had like when I started teaching versus over the years, not necessarily all the way up to today, but obviously that's an influence too, uh, that, that teaching uh, kind of instills a certain sympathy and understanding that like when you're teaching students, every student's experience is different. And some of them are going to resonate with this and some of them are going to learn quickly with this and some are going to totally hate it and some are going to totally excel at it and everything in between. Uh, and that, that uh, and as a teacher, you, you're accommodating all of that. You just have to deal with that entire spectrum on some level. Uh, and that, like, that goes back to a comment I made about uh, understanding that I have an audience uh, as a teacher part of that kind of uh, communication accommodation of all that, that, that it's in, in terms on some level influences the work that I make too, because it's like, okay, how would I be speaking to that student and that student and that student? And it's not like this intrinsic thing where I'm going to set up, a, I'm going to make a piece that speaks to all of them, but on a certain level, slightly conscious, slightly subconscious, uh, makes you aware of I sympathetically agree. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll ask my question. I, I, that's kind of what I was going to ask. I like that it's like, uh, oh, celebrate the way that being an artist makes you a better teacher. So I'm going to push mine a little bit in the other direction, which is like this phrase of uh, those who can't do teach. Yeah. And like if you flip that around, it's like those who teach can't do because you don't, it's so hard to be a full-time, two full-time jobs. Um, and w I'm interested in like, what are the hardest moments of that for you guys? And what are the most useful approaches, techniques, or mindsets that you use for having to actually be two people at the same time? I have full faith in all my colleagues here. But yeah, it's not really a question, but uh, when I look around, it's nothing that, but people that can do, that teach. And I think that's why this program is really exciting than a lot of other programs I've been at because we're all, not to get into the, my diatribe on university, but there are a lot of people that can't do, and that's why they end up in this position, or people that lose the energy and the drive. I, this is a place where, I think, I think in the arts, where we don't step in and step out of a classroom on a clock, I'm there three hours before and three hours after, and it's three o'clock in the morning, and I'm still thinking about solving problems. Uh, I'll do that there first because that's easier I'll say. In, in my world, that line comes up a lot of you can't do teach, except they've corrected it. So it's those who can't do teach poorly. Yeah. Is the way it's really to say. Well, I'm not, so maybe I should have phrased it with that. I, I, yeah. I agree it's, it's that, you, that we can all do, but what I'm more interested in is like, how do you balance? How do you balance? trying to be an artist and a teacher because I don't think it's actually possible. I agree it's not possible. Okay. As I said, it, 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 it's living in, un, there, it is unbalanced. Uh, here, if you're told as, I remember being told as, what, is, what does it take to be an artist? Well, it's like, you know, 100% making the work, and then it's another 50% being a salesman, another 25% being uh, a writer, uh, and, and just the list goes on. It, it's more than what one person can do, and so it's, it's really, examining what can be done in given time frames, again, establishing a context and things that are manageable. And that context for somebody could be a month. Uh, for me, my projects are turning into three year long projects. So I'm looking at things that I can take little bites of that are part of a bigger picture that are continually creating other bigger pictures for longevity. 
I think you can do both. But uh, to, to clarify, can you be a professional artist and a professional teacher? And I don't think you can do any two professional jobs and do them equally, because mm -hmm. one is, okay, I am, my job is to be a teacher. Does that mean I can't be an artist? Absolutely not. Does that mean that if I stopped right now, could I make a living as an artist? Not right away. I would have to transition to all that other promotion of the work and all those other things that you're mentioning. Um, but for me, instead of doing that, I direct all that energy towards teaching. Um, so I, I think there can be a balance there. Would I be a better artist if I wasn't teaching? Probably. Would I be a happier person if I wasn't teaching? Probably not. Would I be, I don't know, basket case living on a mountain? Probably. Um, but, um, so there, there, there's a grounding to teaching, I want to say, and I enjoy teaching. But um, I think you can, it's just, where do you set your bar? You know, am I going to teach and be Damien Hurst? No. <laughs> Would I want to be? No. Uh, is Damien Hurst going to step into a classroom and be worth a damn as a teacher? <laughs> no. So it's where do you where do you where do you define artist? And that's way beyond the scope of this. But where do you define artist? And where is your balance? I think you totally can. You just got to accept that. area for for how do you how do you see yourself continue to make work and, and facilitate those paths forward, make progress. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? Anybody? Anybody have a question? I want to follow up on T's then. I think I think it's teaching and learning is a two way street. And, and, and with, if I'm teaching things that I want to learn more about to incorporate my art that wasn't taught about and to yeah. see what other people do with it is an inspiration and learning that's coming back to me and it becomes cyclical and that it is, it's one of those many things that uh, I look at as an attribute to these positions and I love teaching, it's, it's, it's number one priority at this point, uh, but it's that exchange of information and ongoing outside perspectives and constantly questioning and challenging and, and feeding that in a, a two-way direction. I'm curious, being up in um, in this area, kind of a smaller community, how is, uh, do you feel like your work as artists, not just, you're obviously teaching people in the community and stuff like that, but how's your work as artists, is that at all affected by, related to, and or in conversation with this surrounding area, both in a landscape and in kind of a human community aspect of it? Is there a conversation between Marquette and the UP of Michigan going on in your work? Mine definitely is. <laughs> I, I don't know that the landscapes were shown, but uh, that is absolutely affected. I, I can count at least 10 pieces that it, it has affected visually with things that I put in the background that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. So I've, I've tried to take advantage of the location much in the same way that you know, you know Brian's using the the actual materials, I'm using the actual visuals in some way or another. Uh, but beyond that, um, I, I feel like it has also forced me to reach out of the community more. Uh, I feel like I am busier at some times in my practice than I was when I was down at a, at near a bigger city because I'm forced to connect outside of the, the world here as well. Take the basic things you teach students and make inspire them to be m more than what they are. How do you how do you make it not just how do you how do you push the students? Because I feel like sometimes you teach them the basics, but you but you don't inspire them to 
connect themselves or connect something else into the works where it's just a whole bunch of basic shit. So how do you make that push them to make better work and connect it more to themselves or connect to something that they want to talk about and connect to themselves? A lot of layers and answers to that. Yeah, a lot. I, it's the, it, I start out with problem solving. The problems I present mm -hmm. have a technical component that uh, has a bit of control that can build confidence. And then through that, there's always the celebration of the concept. And that concept, it's the one thing I try not to dictate in a classroom, is that there's always technical and there's a conceptual component, but that con the concept the student is, I charge them with bringing themselves to the table, and that is the art student and the non-art student. And at the end of the day, there's no difference between them because the non-art students dressed themselves this morning just like the art students did, and both of them are using aesthetic decision making. So everybody's an artist on this planet based on just what you're buying and what you're wearing and what you're looking at. Get off of that trip. Everybody's got something to offer. Everybody has something to bring. So I start with a lot of level playing fields music or image-based things that every single one of us is inundated by daily. We all have a favorite genre, a favorite thing, and then that becomes their impetus to find a way to connect it to the work. That, that it shows both weaknesses and strengths, but through that you're getting someone to acknowledge who they are as a person, the here and now, to become conscious, and through that I think is where empowerment begins. And that's when it gets exciting, is when you see somebody realize they have a strength that they didn't realize that was there the whole time, and then it, it, that's the snowball effect, Nevica, that Italian word. Once you start it, it keeps going. Right, and I think kind of going along with that idea of like presenting the basics and how do you get past some of that basic shit to some of the more exciting self, you know, revelatory uh, moments, um, I think a lot of that comes from figuring out what those strengths are. And a lot of these programs, um, and I can, you know, only really speak about digital cinema, but I assume it happens elsewhere too, that um, that I might have a student that comes in that is a really crappy storyteller. They just do not have a good story idea to save their life, but my God, they're so good at cinematography, right? And so it's partly the relationship that the students are able to build with the professors into, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So I can, you know, walk up to that person and be like, let's focus on this. Like, you're aware that you have that strength. I'm aware that you have that strength. Some of this other stuff, like in the real world, you don't necessarily need to know how to do all of this stuff, because if you're going into the industry, at least, again, talking about it from the film perspective, you're probably gonna get plugged into a hole and it, you can be a cinematographer or a camera operator and not be a, a storyteller, right? Or not have that you know, production design in your bones, that's totally fine. Um, so I think it's partly just that relationship that's built between the professor and the students, and we're busy. You know, we have a lot, <laughs> a lot of our own shit going on. And uh, you know, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, that it's really hard, at least in my opinion, it's really hard to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with students if they're expecting me to come take it from them, you know, to walk up to somebody and say, hey, come meet with me in my office, let's talk about your work. Um, but I'm hoping that all students feel like they, ha they are able to do that with us and come and meet with us and say, um, you know, even if it's not somebody in your field, if it's not your advisor walking into you know, somebody who's, who you're taking an elective with and saying, how am I doing, Where, what are my strengths? What should I be focusing on? How can I push myself? So there's only so much pushing we can do, you know, and there's only so much artistry that we can I evoke through the work or through the assignments that we give you. It's, it's about um, you making choices and, and pushing yourselves way more, I think. I think that also relates back to all the things that you were talking about in the beginning, which I'm going to summarize it really poorly, but it's this idea of like you can't make work in a vacuum. You have to have, you have to live in order to put life into your work. And it seems like all of you with your research and, and all of these um, other outlets that you have, whether it's hiking in the woods or hanging out with your kids or whatever, that feeds back into your work and add life to your work. So for all of our students, I think we all hope that they notice those things in their lives that are valuable and are bringing that and applying that to the work. It, it just can't be about the assignment. It also has to be what else is motivating you on top of that thing to make work, mm -hmm. to be an artist. It's not an Sometimes easy. Sometimes it could be just the assignment. It could be that good. Because if it's, I just want to make good stuff, some that's that's the inspiration they don't necessarily and 
I'm going to speak specifically to a lot of client-driven things. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I don't want to come up with an idea. I just want to make a really cool-looking thing if uh, it's what he tells me it's supposed to do. I want to make it look cool to do that. So, um, yeah, my point is it, it doesn't it doesn't always come from here. Uh, some of the motivation comes from here, but it, it certainly doesn't have to be profound, thoughtful. It doesn't even always have to be self-expressive because you can find a lot of motivation in camming computer art. So we're going to make fighting robots. You know, it's like the dumbest, most cliche thing you can think of. It's been overdone a million times, but it can be cool and it can be fun. And you can, if you know how to do that, then yeah, in Transformers 36, you can actually finally do it right. <laughs> Fix the thing. So. But even that, it's like, you're finding nuances, right, that you're bringing to it, hopefully. Eventually, that will yeah. Make it but if you're talking about as educators, um, sometimes nuance doesn't come until later on. Uh, post graduation, years later, six retirement age potentially. <laughs> um, depends on, you know, everybody rationalizes different. Some people come in and they're very nuanced to begin with, and some, um, you know, they're. they're still bulldozers when they graduate, that doesn't mean that they're not equally successful. Just their success is measured differently. Awesome. Not to bash on Transformers, <laughs> but I'm gonna bash on Transformers. <laughs> 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 on that note. Yes, thank you so much.